Good morning. Good morning. We're going to continue our series in the seven sayings of our Savior on the cross. Our text this morning is in John chapter 19. You would turn to John chapter 19. And we'll be in verse number 25. We began this series of studies two weeks ago with the first words of our Savior on the cross, which were, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then last week, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And now this morning we come to the third word, which is in John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we can once again come into your presence to study your word together. We thank you, Lord, for the service that has already begun with our time of worship. And now, Lord, we pray that you would open our understanding as we go through this passage of scripture we pray lord that you would help each one of us we ask this in jesus name amen, amen. now there stood by the cross of jesus his mother like her son mary was also acquainted with grief Back in, in the very beginning, we are told in Luke 1, verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. This was only the forerunner to many troubles. The angel Gabriel had come to announce the fact of what we call the immaculate concession, the miraculous conception for Mary to become the mother of our Lord in this mysterious and heard, unheard of way was no light matter it brought with it a real danger to Mary's reputation and no small trial to her faith at the same time. It's beautiful to see her quiet submission to the will of God. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. This was a beautiful resignation. Nevertheless, she was troubled at it. And as I said, this was just the precursor to many trials and sorrows. You remember when she was large with child, what sorrow it must have caused her to find that there was no room in the inn and they had to go into the slowly stable where she had to lay her newborn babe in a manger. Think of the anguish that Mary must have had when she learned of Herod's purpose to destroy the life of her little baby. Imagine what troubled her mind when because of Herod, she was forced to go down into Egypt for several years. What piercing of her soul when she saw her son despised and rejected of men. Who can estimate what she passed through as she stood there as her son 
hung on the cross. If Christ was the man of sorrows, then Mary was truly the woman of sorrows. Our text says there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Here we see the fulfillment of Simeon's prophecy. The Mosaic law required that the parents of a child should bring him to the temple to present him to the Lord. <clears throat> Old Simeon, the priest, was just waiting for the Messiah. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. We read in Luke 2, verse 26, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon picked up the baby Jesus and took him into his arms and he blessed God and he said Lord now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel then he turned to Mary and he said, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against, yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What a strange word to Mary's ears. Could it be that her great privilege was to bring with it the greatest of all sorrows? It seemed unlikely at the time when Simeon spoke these words. Yet how truly and tragically it all came to pass. Here at the cross, the prophecy of Simeon was fulfilled. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. After the days of his infancy and his childhood and all during the Lord's ministry, we see and we hear very little from Mary. Her life was lived in the background among the shadows, but now she stands there at the cross. Here is where we see the mother's heart displayed. She's the dying man's mother, the one who agonizes. There on the cross is her child, no mother ever suffered the way she did. His disciples may desert him. His friends may forsake him. His nation may despise him. But his mother stands there at the foot of his cross. There was no hysterical sorrow. There was no show of feminine weakness, no crying out in anguish, no fainting. She stood there silent. Not a word from Mary is recorded in any of the four Gospels. Apparently, Mary suffered there in silence. The crowds are mocking Jesus, the thieves hanging one on each side are taunting him. The priests are jeering at him and the soldiers are callous and indifferent. Our Savior is bleeding. He's dying. And there is his mother watching all of this awful mockery. It's a wonder she didn't just faint at the sight of it. 
It's a wonder she didn't run away from this spectacle. But no, she represses her grief and she stands there silently. Once again, our text says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Here we see the perfect man, Jesus, setting the example for children to honor their parents. The words given to Moses on Mount Sinai, these words have never been repealed. The words are there in Exodus chapter 20, but then they are repeated in Ephesians 6. Listen while I read. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. It's too often assumed that this fifth commandment is addressed just to young folks, but nothing could be further from the truth. In the course of time, these children become adults. They're no longer under the control of their parents but their obligation to them has never ceased. The very least they can do is to hold their parents in high esteem and to reverence them. During his early years, the boy Jesus was under the control of Mary, his mother, and Joseph, his legal father. You remember when Jesus was 12 years old, his parents took him to Jerusalem for the Passover. After the feast, they left for Nazareth with their children and their friends, and they supposed that Jesus was with them, but instead he had remained in Jerusalem, and after a full day's journey, they discovered that he was not with them, and they turned back immediately to Jerusalem and there to find him in the temple. His mother asked him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Jesus had hardly ever been away from them. The fact that she and Joseph had sought him sorrowing shows the beautiful relationship that existed between them at their home in Nazareth. The answer that Jesus gave shows us the honor he had for his mother. He said, wist ye not? That means surely you must have known that nothing would keep me except my father's business. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But there's more, just like it is with us, it was the same way with him. His years of obedience to Mary and Joseph ended, but not the years of honor. In the last and awful hours of his human life, suffering there on the cross. The Lord Jesus thought of her who loved him and whom he loved, and he provided for her future needs by committing her to the care of that disciple who most deeply understood his love. Now perhaps just a word here about his form of address he calls her woman. That's not a derogatory term. He calls her woman specifically. So far as the record 
of the four Gospels goes, never once did he call her mother. I think he was looking down through the centuries that were to come with his omniscient foresight, and he must have seen that awful system of Mariolatry, that worship of Mary that was about to be built up. He refrained from using the word mother because that would countenance idolatry and the idolatry of rendering to Mary the homage which was due to her son alone. The idolatry of worshiping her as the mother of God or worshiping her as the queen of heaven, singing hymns to Mary, praying to her, kissing her picture, parading her image through the streets and bowing down to her statue. It's all Mariolatry and it's all abomination. So twice in the book of John, our Lord addresses Mary as woman. John's gospel is well known for setting forth the deity of Christ. John presents Christ as the Son of God who is above all human relationships. And that's why here the Lord Jesus addresses Mary as woman. On the cross, our Lord commending Mary to the care and of his beloved disciple is best understood in the light of Mary's widowhood. The Gospels do not specifically record Joseph's death, but there's little doubt that he died sometime before Jesus began his public ministry. <clears throat> Nothing is seen of Joseph after Jesus was a boy of 12. Later on at the marriage feast of Cana where he did his first miracle of changing the water into wine, there's not a hint of Joseph being present. Now back to our text, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he saith unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. Here we see that John had returned to the Savior's side. Perhaps the most bitter dregs of all in that cup that he had to drink was the fact that his apostles would all forsake him. The Lord Jesus had warned them in Matthew 26 of their approaching cowardice. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. <clears throat> And not only Peter, but all of the apostles affirmed their determination to stand by the Lord Jesus. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise said all of the apostles. <laughs> Nevertheless, they all <laughs> deserted him. And Matthew had said, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. That word that is translated offended might well have been scandalized. They were ashamed to be found in his company. Now we do see that that unfaithfulness of the apostles was only temporary. Later on, they looked for him at the appointed place in Galilee. Which one of this little band of apostles, which one of them will show the superiority of his love? The scripture shows us 
John standing there at the cross. John has returned to the Savior's side, and there he received a blessed commission from the Lord himself. We have already seen that it was an expression of his tender love and committing Mary into the hands of his disciple. For John to take charge of the widowed mother of our Lord was a blessed commission. When Jesus said to him, Behold thy mother, it was as if he had said, Let her be to you as your own mother. Let your love for me be shown in your tender regard for her. In John 19 and verse 27, it says, From that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. In John chapter 20, when John enters into the sepulcher and he sees the clothing laying there, but the sepulcher was empty, the scripture says he sees and he believes. Because up until this time, their faith had not yet understood the promise of Christ's resurrection. <clears throat> Scripture says, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. We're not told why they did this, but the explanation is obvious. Now that he has learned that the Savior is risen from the dead, John hurries back to his home to tell Mary the good news, who more than Mary could rejoice at the fled tidings. The Lord Jesus was dying as the Savior of sinners. He was engaged in the most momentous, the most stupendous undertaking that this earth has ever witnessed. Nevertheless, Jesus does not fail to make provision for her who, according to the flesh, was his mother. How different is the Mary of Scripture from the Mary of superstition? She was no proud Madonna. She was a sinner, just like you and me. Now at the death of the Lord Jesus, he's found there at the cross. The word of God does not present her as the queen of heaven. She's not decked out with a queen's diadem on her head. No, she's just a humble lady. She herself rejoices in the Savior. It's true that she is blessed among women, but that does not mean that she is blessed above women. She stood by the cross, and as she stood there, the Savior speaking to John said, Woman, behold thy son. And to John he said, Behold thy mother. Next week, we're going to look at Christ's fourth word from the, Christ, from the cross, one of the most powerful of all, where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For the red, would you leave us in prayer? Yes. Father, what a mighty God you are. Yes. Lord, that you gave yourself for us, Lord, and we thank you so much for the reading of your holy word. Lord, thank you for this day that we have gathered together to worship you. And I thank you for Pastor Randy as he comes to bring us the yes. word in just a few minutes. And Lord, we welcome the Holy Spirit into the service today that we might honor you in all things that we do. We ask him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank <clears throat> you.